to welcome you to worship on this second Sunday in June. I want to thank all those who participated in our service and worked hard to make it meaningful. I also want to say for all of you who are wondering uh, what worship will look like coming up, in the next few weeks we'll have more information about new opportunities that we can engage together. But as we join together this morning, I invite you to center yourself on Christ, to find the Holy Spirit wherever you may be, and to center yourself so that we can grow together even when we are apart. Let us join together in worship. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Let us be receptive to the work of God in every place. Let us be open to something new. Let us be vulnerable to the ways the resurrection of Jesus still transforms. Let us be open to be renewed. Let us be attentive to the Holy Spirit's breath in and around this community. Lord of all, let us be open to you. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I am so glad that you are here with me today. We can spend a few moments together. You know, I was down cleaning in my basement this week, and I came across a really special piece of clothing. I brought it with me today to share it with you. This is one of Jacob's t-shirts. This was when he was a tiny baby. 
I'll bet that in somewhere your mom and dad might have a t-shirt or a piece of clothing from when you were a little baby. And I'll bet if you tried to fit into it that you wouldn't be able to. I know my Jacob wouldn't be able to fit into this today. And I think if you tried, it would be uncomfortable. And that's because you've grown up. It's because you've changed. You see, when we grow up and we change and we become bigger, we have to have bigger clothes. We have to have new clothes to fit our new selves. You know, Jesus said something about this. He talked about putting new wine into old wineskins. Now, wineskins were just something that you could hold wine in. It was like a container. And if you put the new young wine into an old wineskin, it would, it would burst, it would break, and you would lose both the wine and the wineskin, so you would have nothing to drink. That's kind of like if you tried to put this on. It might tear the seams because it's old and you are new. Jesus said that we need to have new wine and new wineskins. That when you put the new into the new, you preserve both of them and they can both be used. I think what Jesus was trying to say is that we grow and we change and things become new and we can't spend all of our time trying to make that new person that we are fit into the old clothing because if we do we won't get very far we might miss when we were little and wearing these clothes. But when we wore these clothes, we couldn't walk or talk or ride bicycles or help mom and dad make food or draw our, write our names or draw on the sidewalk with chalk. Now we can do lots of new things. And because we can do new things, we need to continue to wear new clothes, to look forward to the new things that we can do, and to do the things that Jesus called us to do. Because now, you can be kind to one another, you can love one another, you can help others. You couldn't do those things when you wore this clothing. But now you can do lots of things because you have grown up, you are a new person, and you're in new clothing. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for my old clothing Thank you that it served to keep me warm when I was little. Thank you for new clothing that helps me to grow and to run and to play and to do all the things that I can do now. Thank you, God, for this new time Help us to see this new time as a new opportunity to love you and to love others. Amen.
Let us bow our heads and join together in prayer. Holy God, on this day, we are thankful for the opportunity to worship. We are thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us about love, who taught us about the Holy Spirit and the way that God continues to work within our world. God, on this day, we come to you with many heavy things on our hearts. God, today we name some of the challenges within our own community. God, we pray for Fred Hathaway, who has had continued numbness. And they found out this week through meeting with doctors and having to go into the hospital uh, that Fred is in need of vascular bypass surgery and is, in fact, today, Sunday, is receiving that surgery. God, we pray for Fred and Nancy and for the whole family that it might resolve some of the challenges that he's faced recently. God, we pray for Nancy Donahue, who will have surgery this week. We pray for a successful surgery and strength and recovery. God, we pray for Linda Johnson's brother-in-law who is going into hospice care. We pray for him and for Linda's sister and for the family and the difficulty of that transition. God, I wanna lift the passing of my Uncle Paul this past week, who passed from cancer. Prayers for my Aunt Kathy and our family as we grieve his loss. I also want to name uh, a church member who is uh, working with her siblings through sorting after a deep family loss and some of the challenges that come with that. God, we know in the midst of all of our challenges that you are there. So we ask that we might feel your presence in the midst of them. God, in the same way we lift the prayers that we may not have spoken out loud or written on a card, but that we hold on our hearts. Let us lift them silently to you, our prayers of concern. Holy God, hear our prayers. God, and in the same way, we have many joys that we celebrate. God, we're thankful for successful surgery for Al Cleary. We pray for his continued recovery. We're thankful for the doctors that attended to him and the good news. We pray also for the anticipatory joy of new life that we pray will come to our congregation this week. God, we're also joyful for the upcoming opportunities for new ways to worship together. And God, we're also thankful for the gift of community that keeps us strong in the midst of trials. God, hear us now as we silently lift our prayers of joy to you. We praise and thank you, almighty God for all the ways that you intercede in our lives and help us to know of your love. As a community gathered in many places, 
but focused on that same love and Jesus Christ, we join now together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. comes from Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 through 17. Hear now these words. As Jesus was walking along he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he said to him follow me and he got up and he followed him and as he sat at dinner in the house many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this they said to his disciples why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then, then they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak, and the worst tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins, otherwise the skin bursts, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed, but new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Norm was well loved and respected hard-working, peaceful, and had some of the greatest stories you have ever heard. They were liked by so many, and the amount of people who were comforted by Norm was almost extraordinary. With Norm, people were often their most authentic selves. 
They talked with less anxiety and worry and generally knew exactly what made them happy. Norm made them happy. And while Norm was thought to be the greatest by so many, Norm also had some humility. The strangest thing about Norm is that even though everybody knew Norm and many people yearned for Norm, most people, because of everything going on, don't even know that Norm is gone. They assume that Norm is fine and well and that Norm will return soon and everybody can be comfortable and happy again. Interestingly enough, other people thought that Norm passed away ages ago. And they even talk like Norm left us decades ago. And in some ways, maybe Norm had. Who really knows? But what I know now is that Norm, as much as we wish it weren't so, is gone. Norm passed away on March 13th, 2020. And though Norm is deeply missed, Norm has left a legacy. And we are thankful for the memories. And we hope that knowing Norm will spur us towards an even better future. Yes, as much as we don't want to admit it, however we may have viewed it, and however we may grieve it, normal is over. I think one of the hardest parts of what is going on right now is that it has taken what we hold as normal and throws it out. This effect has a, a ripple on each part of our lives. And that includes our faith lives. The communal nature of worship, singing, praying, sharing, communion, falling asleep during the sermon together. All of that has been taken. Hugs and handshakes, getting a chance to ask that casual question of how someone is doing, all of that was taken away when coronavirus came. Further, the things that we hold in our collective memory over time has also been taken away. How we worship, where we worship, where we sit, which pew is our pew, the people who sit around us, and even the chance to cherish the moments as we watch the children around us grow. The longer memory of what makes church, church, seems to be on pause right now. We can't wait to get back to what church was and the way things should be. But the question for us now is, with our norms gone, what will that even look like? What happens when the norm of what we hold dear is no longer possible or the perfect option? What would it look like to be challenged in how we worship, even how we assume we are to follow God? The truth is, I bet that's a little of what the Pharisees and the followers of John the Baptist were feeling when they encountered Christ. Who is this person? We have always done church and faith in this way. What is he doing? Both the Pharisees and the followers of John the Baptist were trying so deeply to understand Christ. They could not begin to understand how and why Jesus was not following the laws of their faith that were commonly held. They asked, why? Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Or in other words, why do you sit with people that we don't think are good? And why don't you and your disciples fast? Why don't you follow the law? And Jesus answers, I came for the sinners to show mercy. And if fasting is to stay right with God, I am the Son of God. And he says, there's no need to mourn when I am with you. The disconnect between Christ and the Pharisees and the followers of John the Baptist happened because they had different understandings of what was necessary for faith. 
the ritual, the rule. What Christ was saying is that what is necessary in faith and action is to do the right thing. Something that's not performative, but something that is restorative. That was the message of Christ. Christ invites them to take a step back from their expectations and hear the good news. So he tells them this parable in response. If you put a new patch on an old pair of jeans and you wash them, what happens? You see, the new patch shrinks when it's washed, but the worn jeans do not. And so all of a sudden, you're going to tear a hole that's bigger than the one that you started with. Then he talks about wine, something that us Methodists, I'm sure, know nothing about. But he talks about this ancient practice of winemaking where you would take grapes and you would crush them and put them into an animal skin, usually a goat skin, lined jars with skins. And the skins would be new so that they could stretch as the yeast soaked up the sugar and it would cause this buildup of CO2 and the fermentation process causes great pressure on the animal skin and the skin stretches over time. And then it expands to its limit. So the truth is, if you take a skin that has already been stretched and you try to make new wine, the skin will burst because it's already lost its ability to flex, to stretch. If you knew... If you use a new skin, though, it will expand as needed. So why does he use these two images? This is a commentary on fasting, but it's also a recognition that the old way, the accepted way by many, sometimes fails to match up with a new reality presented by Christ. The new wine requires a new wineskin to be open to hearing the new word of Christ. No matter what the norm was up to this point, Christ is inviting them to a new way. A way that stands counter to what was accepted and thought of as true. But this new way offers a full understanding of the work and grace of God. Christ is is not deterred by the norms. He still stands in solidarity with those who are oppressed. He says, I'm here to be with the sinner. And he has no qualms about breaking the religious laws for the betterment of those of whom he is encountering. Christ calls us to live into the hope of that new word. Christ presented that new hope to all that he encountered. But some were just not acceptable. They were just not able to accept it, I should say. They had lost their flexibility, and from this loss, they lost sight of God in their midst. They lost the ability to be made new. But that did not change Christ's desire to teach them and to invite them. We too are called to a new way of living in Christ. We are called to be new vessels, willing to receive Christ, willing to be flexible, to ferment and process the truth that is provided to us and transform into something new and whole. We must live and be alive in the message of Christ, moving away from the things that would hold us back, cause us to resist a life dedicated to Jesus. It is a reminder to me that sometimes we have to be able to endure something new, a new time with new eyes, new openness, new opportunities. I would say it's okay to yearn for our connection and to hope for something meaningful that we can grasp onto in worship and fellowship in many ways. But at the same time, sometimes if we get so stuck in what we've already done, it's so easy to lose perspectives on how we can see the full potential of everything that lies ahead of us. 
when we accept Jesus, we lose our ties to all that limits us, but instead we're invited to step forth in faith and embrace a life of celebrating Christ and sharing Christ with others. We feast on the Spirit and reframe our faith to be actively pursuing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That is why we cannot read about wineskins until we read about dining with sinners and healing because of the newness of Christ. We have to understand the image in the context of grace, that we are called to accept others with flexibility, that we are called to embrace Jesus in new ways. It calls us out of ourself and calls us into community with all others. We are called to this bold new reality that every time we draw a line, Christ is on the other side of that line, standing arms outstretched for us and all who are waiting to find community like ours. New wineskins means when we look at the world today, we do so without the expectation that nothing can change, but that we can be moved and grow by being in relationship with others who are seeking in faith to love God and to love our neighbor. It's the same question that the early church asked. How could they worship? How could they be in community with one another? How could they live out their faith? What rules do they have to follow? The answer, even when they were divided on what rules to follow, they were told over and over again by Peter and Paul and others in the early church that they were called to be united in Christ, whatever that might look like. They were invited to show love. We think about our own story, our tie to Methodism, and we talked about that a few weeks ago. But early in the Methodist movement, these house churches sprung up and small bands of people gathered together and they asked, how will we learn about Christ? And although they had pastors that would ride the circuit, would go to different gatherings, it was the people themselves that sought to understand Christ together in community and supporting one another. The truth is, even now, in the challenge of this day, some things have changed dramatically and other things have not changed at all. People are still seeking authentic relationships with God, with friends, and to make a difference for others. And that authenticity of faith is what we are seeking to embrace at all times, in all ways, in whatever form it may be, even though it may look and feel a little different than we are used to. Maybe the relationships are built when we can say we do not have the market cornered on worship, or we don't have the fullest understanding of what we can do to honor God, but instead we embrace that we're open to new and meaningful ways to express worship and fellowship and community. Different forms of worship may help us to experience God in a different way. How can we be part of that? What would it look like if we could be part of something new, building new relationships, open to the work of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit in the world? What would it be? Who would we include in on that conversation? How would we honor the voices that have built our church to be what it is today and honor as well the voices of those who we have yet to reach or have unknowingly excluded? What if we could sit side by side with different backgrounds, different social and faith beliefs, different economic situations, different stages in life, and still, still see one another as God's beloved creation? What would it look like to find our community in Jesus, 
the one who said it is your faith that has made you well. What would it be to be open? I'm thankful for our church because I know that we are open to people with differing beliefs, differing backgrounds. What would it be to continue that invitation to others and to see what we can do together to widen our invitation? The truth is over the next few months, just as it has been the last few months, things are going to be a little different. I'm afraid to say that there will be no normal. Instead, as new wineskins, we are called in faith to embrace the new realities of worship and fellowship and what faith might look like. And if we embrace it, no matter how different it will be, I think that we will find God's fingerprints all over it. This week and next week, as we gather a team we've been gathering to talk about what that form of worship might look like, what it might be as we start to work towards coming together again. As we contemplate those differences, we must be open to what that might be. And I think if we can open up ourselves to it, we will find it to be an incredible blessing. Let us be open to a shift away from relying on the norms to instead see if we can just be open to it. God has and will continue to do some profound and beautiful things through our community of faith. What can it be? Let us be renewed to dream again. Let us believe that in Christ we can be made new to live it out in the world. We say, here we are, Lord. Send us, use us, embolden us. God, as we seek to live into love and grace, as we seek to be community together, God, we are open to what that will mean in you. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
As we close worship today, our family has a special announcement. Mommy, how much of this one have a new baby coming? <laughs> there is a new baby coming to the Hart household. We will soon be embracing something new to us. And we're so excited to share that with all of you. I'm going to be a bee sister from now on. <laughs> <laughs> and in November. Yeah. And November. I love babies. <laughs> and they are hot. As we go forth from this place with the confidence of the people of God, let us realize that normal may not be what we think it to be. But as we go forward, that we know in the power of Christ that we can embrace something new together. Go forth in love and grace. Amen. Amen.